Good afternoon and welcome to the AI track. Thank you for joining us today. If you have any questions for any of the panellists, please post them in the Q&A section and the panellists will try to answer them towards the end of the session. And now I'm pleased to introduce Monica Livingston, AI Sales Director at Intel and Track Chair for this afternoon. Over to you, Monica. Hi, thank you, Carrie. Welcome everybody to the AI session. So um, we have a couple of things on the agenda today. We have two presentations and then a panel conversation as well as um, Q&A at the end. Um, we are all here live, so feel free to please um, put your questions into the chat box at any time. I will be monitoring the chat um, for questions and then um, making sure that we answer as many of them as possible at the end of the session. So with that, we'll go ahead and go into our um, first um, our first presentation, and that is from Anadot. I would like to introduce Ira Cohen, who is the co-founder and chief data scientist. Ira, over to you. Thank you very much and uh, happy to be here. Uh, let me just uh, share my screen and we will begin. All right, so for those of you who haven't read in the in the program, the topic of today is uh, challenges in leveraging AI, machine learning in autonomous network monitoring and how to overcome them. So I'm, uh, I'm the chief data scientist for Anadot, one of the founders, and uh, my background is in uh, machine learning. I've been doing uh, machine learning since my graduate school in, uh, in University of Illinois since the early 2000s. And, um, and so uh, in my roles, I had a lot of experience trying to push various machine learning capabilities into products. Uh, and uh, at Anadot, basically, uh, we designed a product that is centered around machine learning uh, for, uh, for network monitoring and uh, for business monitoring in general. And I wanted to share some of the challenges uh, of doing it uh, and making it a reality. So, um, we all know that uh, smart enterprises invest today a lot in uh, AI, ML. I like to call it ML. I think AI is too broad of a term. Uh, so machine learning to solve real problems. And the reason is that uh, data is really the thing that uh, flows today everywhere and we know how to collect it. And, and machine learning is the thing that can leverage the data to provide, to transform it from data to information that is actionable. Um, and I think uh, we, we see in a lot of reports, we see it in, in, the, uh, in many industries that uh, whoever drives their decision-making with data starts becoming more efficient. Uh, and the way to, to drive it at large scale uh, with more accuracy and, and speed is using data science. So really machine learning, uh, AI in general is shaping the future, and that's something we all are uh, aware of. But, uh, well, also we are seeing it in numbers, and there are various reports showing that 92% of enterprises are increasing how much they are uh, investing in uh, big data and AI, machine learning based solutions. Uh, in telcos, definitely this is happening fast. In Vodafone, I think this is one of the, you know, in the latest reports, uh, we've all read that uh, it, it is a big agenda and uh, definitely uh, it's being pushed in various parts of the organizations in telcos. Um, and one big part of it is in the uh, monitoring space or, you know, towards a zero touch network that can monitor and heal itself. Now, those that, that actually uh, implement a, a machine learning based solutions to, to known problems, uh, the early adapters, they do report really good uh, uh, ROI from it, three to 15% profit margin improvements, higher than the, their industry standard. And there is a nice report from McKinsey and company that, uh, that shows it for various industries. But at, uh, at the same time, uh, uh, people report, uh, a lot of companies report, and I'm sure whoever deals with managing uh, these projects see that 88% of them fail. So 
if we look at, so the, there, are, there are two conflicting things here. The, th the nice thing uh, from this McKinsey report is that they actually measure, uh, measure it for uh, AI ad adapters with, uh, you know, that are just experimenting or, or uh, partial adapters. So they're doing half of the work, uh, the ones that are doing it very proactively and non-adapters. And uh, it's, it's clear, it's very clear that if you do it uh, uh, with a proactive strategy and you take it all the way through in the right way, there is a lot of gain in terms of uh, profit margins. If you're only doing it in a half effort or not a complete effort and, and failing a lot, it actually in certain cases even reduces your uh, profit margins compared to not doing anything. So there is, there is a risk of, of adapting a strategy with AI, if you don't do it correctly, it could actually end up hurting the bottom line. So this is summarizing it. Uh, you do it right, you can get really good uh, profit margins uh, compared to industry peers. Uh, but uh, if you don't, uh, if there, if you don't define the, uh, the project correctly, um, it can fail at the experimental stage. There are many reasons to, for that. So why do these projects fail? Why do we see all these uh, uh, failures happening? I, I like, uh, of course, there could be many, many reasons. Uh, I like to think of them as four, four, four main reasons. Uh, I think the first one is a lot of times uh, um, people are stuck with the AI ML buzzword saying, oh, we have AI ML, let's apply it to a problem and it's not a good fit to solve it with AI ML. A applying machine learning to any problem comes with a cost, both in terms of non-determinism, non-deterministic risk, uh, you don't know where it, where it can help. And if you can solve that same problem, and I'm, you know, I'm a machine learning guy, I've been doing machine learning all my life. If you can solve a problem without it, you shouldn't use machine learning. Uh, if you can solve it deterministically, you should use that deterministic way of solving the problem. Machine learning adds complexity because it's fed, it's fed by data, it can make errors. Um, you, you might not want to use it for every problem. And, and I've seen too many cases where uh, people think that they can, the problem can be, should be solved with the ML just because it's a buzzword. And at the end of the day, it fails because it's not a good fit. Um, the second thing is uh, unclear unrealistic requirements and success criteria as expecting magic, uh, changing their requirements along the way, which actually can have a big implications on how a product is developed uh, and uh, having non-measurable success criteria, um, if at all. And I've seen projects where there were no good success criteria, just you know, very fluffy success criteria. If, just like any other project, if it's not measurable, it's very hard to know whether it's doing the right thing. Um, if the requirements keep changing, uh, then it's very, uh, it could have huge implications on the machine learning and data science behind the scenes, uh, which may cause it to fail altogether. Uh, just a short example, if your requirement is that it does things in real time, uh, if and the initial requirement did not have that, it could completely change the whole makeup of the type of algorithms the data science team would choose for solving the problem. Uh, so these implications may seem small sometimes, but uh, uh, they could have very dramatic effect on the project. Too big and complex. I mean, I've seen too many cases uh, of trying to solve multiple problems uh, or very, very large problems that can be broken up into lots of smaller ones, but trying to solve the whole thing at once uh, and then trying to solve multiple problems with the same tool behind the scenes, which not, might not fit it just because you purchased or acquired or, or decided on some platform for doing data science on, which might not fit every problem. It's, it's a lot of times, especially in these early days, it's better to use a best of breed solution for every specific problem and rather than try to solve everything with one platform. Um, and uh, there are, of course, a lot of data challenges involved of getting data, getting data out of silos, their structure, their scale, and that could lead to a lot of delays in projects. And the bigger the project, the more delays it causes. And then after a while, budget runs out or there's some uh, uh, 
uh, uh, more pressure from management and the project gets canceled and all the investment gets lost. The last one is cultural resistance, which, which can happen often. Um, it's, uh, you know, people fearing that they're losing, they're going to lose their jobs. That's usually, um, you know, I think that's, uh, that's a valid fear, but a lot of times it's not, uh, it's not warranted. Uh, a lot of, in a lot of cases I've seen machine learning doesn't replace the humans. It really frees up the time to do, to be a lot more efficient and effective in the same role that they're doing. Um, uh, but there's a lot of failures that happen because of insufficient training of a new tool, because uh, people are not used to uh, a solution that is based on machine learning, uh, and you need to train them on that. Or the solutions are designed when, you know, and this is part of the requirements uh, that are not clear enough. Uh, if they're not clear enough, a lot of times data scientists will, will produce a solution that's good for data scientists. Uh, and, and will not be good or understood by end users and they will create the product very complex. And then when it's rolled out to end users, they just don't know what to do with it and, and it fails. So these are kind of generic reasons why some of these projects fail and it could be any type of project that you think about. Uh, but I wanted to talk about network monitoring in particular. So do we believe that it can be used uh, for network monitoring and overcome all of these challenge? Uh, the answer is yes. And the reason I'm very certain about this answer is because uh, we built a product that does it. Uh, so it would be kind of uh, uh, silly if, if I didn't think it was true. Um, but I'm going to describe in a bit more details what we had to think about when we designed this product and started rolling it out to make sure that uh, we don't hit any of these uh, uh, road bumps that will make it a failure in this space. So the first question is, is it a good fit? And as I said, you know, you have to ask yourself with every project, every problem that you're trying to solve with machine learning, is it a good fit? And the way I like to think about it, and I heard this from somebody in the field uh, a few years ago, and even though I was doing it in my mind, I, I, he, he kind of concisely said, um, how do you actually evaluate whether, uh, uh, even before you start, whether a machine learning can be applied to, a cert to solve a certain problem? And really you have to answer yes to at least one of these three questions on the left. Is, do you need a solution uh, that is better at scale than the existing one? If you look at network monitoring today, uh, you know, there are lots of citations about, uh, and, and we've, we've talked to lots of companies about how many alerts they're getting today and what's the scale of uh, the things that they need to monitor. And, uh, and it's in, you know, if you sum it up over all telcos, it's in the billions. We've, we, we work with telcos, uh, mid-size, large size. Some of them get to millions of alerts a day to their knock. Some of them gets to 100,000 alerts, uh, fault alerts to uh, day to their knock. And that's, that number is huge. Um, so definitely there is a scalability issue because you need to hire so many people to go over these alerts or you miss because you don't notice them. Now, are, there, are these alerts, existing alerts, accurate enough? Can you improve it with machine learning? Well, it's it's quite easy to see uh, that yes, there there's a very high false positive rates in the existing uh, alerts alerting system that don't even leverage machine learning, and uh, you know it takes some experimentation, but um, it, I think at this point in time. Um, we see, and, and we've seen others see the same thing, that the accuracy, the reduction in false positive is quite significant if you can apply correctly machine learning algorithms for the network monitoring uh, uh, alert, alerts, to create network monitoring alerts. Last one is speed. Do you need, do you need something fast? Do you need the answers really quickly? Um, in this case, the answer is yes as well, because, uh, you know, we. We have customers that had knocks dealing with tens of thousands of alerts a day, and it kind of really the speed kind of relates sometimes to the scale. Uh, but at the end of the day, they found that uh, you know they detect problems faster if they just track their down detector page, and down detector page is basically a customer complaining, people actually complaining, uh, and you don't want to reach that stage that. You, that 
you know, even though you monitor everything in real time, at the end of the day, you get your, your uh, tickets open from your customers or from down detector. It's not something that, uh, that's, that should happen. So the answer is yes to all of these three, and that's why this is a good fit for, uh, for uh, using machine learning to solve this problem. Now comes the question, okay, so it's a good fit. We know we can do it, but you have to build a product. What would be the requirements and success criteria that uh, are valid and good for this problem? So requirements come from the success criteria. Uh, so the first two here on this, uh, on this slide are basically the basic requirement that you want from, from, from the reason you're doing monitoring in the, or in the first place. Uh, you want to detect that there are network issues. You want to detect that there are service issues uh, as quickly as possible and redo, and you want this new system to reduce the mean time to detect the issues. If you are going to apply machine learning, part of the reason is speed. You want to detect it as early as possible before uh, customers experience the issues or when a minimum number of them experience an issue. And uh, so that's, that's definitely part of the success criteria. Reduce it compared to today. Now, how do you actually get, how do you achieve uh, a reduction in mean time to detect issue? Well, the, uh, there are two main requirements that we put on our system, on our product, uh, and it has implications throughout the architecture and the algorithms that we have to use. Uh, the first one is to apply anomaly detection on all of the network performance metrics, not just a part of them, not just a small subset of them. It has to be applied on all of them. Anomaly detection is basically a, a subfield in machine learning, uh, algorithms that can detect, and I'll show a few examples of those, that detect that there is anomalous behavior. And here, anomalies on network performance metrics um, can detect very early if you apply them to all of them at any granularity from the switches to the antennas, to the, uh, to the base stations, to the sites, uh, and to the services that you have. If you apply them on all of them and then uh, get alerts on these anomalies, you are ensured that uh, first anomaly detection algorithms applied correctly, they'll do it fast. They'll find it immediately as it starts, as it starts behaving abnormally. If you do it on all of them, it means you're covered 100% for all of your network. And you need it to run really fast. You, you need near real time detection. Near real time is within one minute of things happening. Uh, so it's, it doesn't have to be live. We found that uh, nobody needs it in, in, you know, after one second because they can't react to it anyways, and you want to wait a little bit. Uh, but after one minute uh, is, a good, is a good near real time detection. The second success criteria is reduction in mean time to repair. So detecting that there are issues is great, but at the end of the day, you want to repair it. You want to solve it so as quickly as possible. And uh, um, to do that, really, uh, um, the requirements that we put on our system are, are three. First of all, if we are detecting that there is a network issue on one or more of the network performance metrics, we want to be able to correlate them automatically to all the related anomalies of you know, any other uh, network uh, KPIs that might be around. And uh, so this is, this is similar to, uh, um, you know, to how doctors work, right? So uh, you come to the doctors, you say, I'm sick. That's the detection of the anomaly because you feel something. And then the doctor looks at all your measurements, all your set of symptoms, uh, basically to understand what is happening, why it's happening, or what is the right remediation action. So you have a sore throat and you have a, a fever and a runny nose uh, and it's very red, he might give you antib antibiotics or give you a different medicine. That's the remediation action. Uh, here it's the same. We have a network, a lot, very large network with lots of different components and, and there could be anomalies throughout it. You, you detect that there is a performance issue with the detection, with the, with the anomaly detection, and the correlation basically, basically brings together all the set of symptoms and possible causes that cause this network issue to happen. Uh, and doing it automatically, correlating all the things automatically across the different layers of the network into one incident basically lets you reduce the time to repair because you can figure it out much quicker. Now to do this uh, autonomous correlation, 
first you need to design algorithms that can find the, these correlations. These are not linear correlations, but anything that's related to it, anything that behaviorally is related to the issue. And, uh, but to do it, you actually have to be, have a system, have a product that can collect data from multiple sources um, and then learn the, re and, and, and if you want to automatically remediate it, also learn the automatic remediation actions that can be taken given, uh, given a problem. Um, the next set of uh, success criteria are, are more related to the process, to these problem three and four, making it too complex or solving multiple problems. So first solve one problem at a time. And also the, uh, the problem of, uh, of the people problem, the process problem. So you want to reduce false positives. People get alert fatigue. If there are a lot of false positives, they just ignore everything. So you, the machine learning has to be uh, very robust and accurate. Otherwise, even if it finds the right things, if half of them are wrong, then people will ignore everything. Uh, so you have to have context aware anomaly filtering and you have to, uh, and what we built into our system <clears throat> as part of the requirement um, is the ability to uh, do semi-supervised learning based on feedbacks. But our requirement is that the system has to work even without feedbacks. Uh, and if there are feedbacks, then it improves itself. Another success criteria is reducing the number of alerts to the knock. In, in network management, we've seen it. People get 50,000 alerts per day, a million alerts per day, too many. Uh, so reducing that number into concise incidents automatically uh, is a big issue. And you know, if you do this correlation that I mentioned before, then you can get uh, uh, autonomous uh, alert correlation as well for free uh, based on the machine learning. And uh, last success criteria is really shortening the time to value uh, minimum. <clears throat> So having a product that doesn't require a lot of customization, the, uh, can do, the, the ML needs to be as autonomous as possible with no data science required by anybody on, on in the, our product. We don't need to do any configuration for a new customer or a new use case, not on our side, not on the customer side. Uh, the algorithm should work out of the box and the product has to really be usable uh, to, for, for people to be able to use it properly uh, and not data scientists and have easy integrations to multiple data sources. So the, all of these requirements bring us to our product, what we built. And I think any product that does this needs to go through these requirements and steps. Otherwise they, they fall short and it might fail at the end if you try to apply it to your uh, network monitoring. Uh, so anomaly detection has to be very accurate and robust. Here we are you know, we're never 100% done, so it's 90, 99% done. The root cause analysis or correlation for helping root cause analysis, this is really, uh, you know, using algorithms to do it really alleviates the need for any in manual inputs which don't, don't, uh, they don't survive enough. Um, and remediation, uh, you know, once you do these first steps, you start creating your database that can actually, uh, uh, where you collect all the, all the incidents that happened in the past with their set of symptoms, the anomalies that made up those uh, problems, and you attach it to remediation actions that users did. And now you can have a system that learns to map anomalies and their causes to the right remediation action automatically. Uh, and this is really where we are. We are at 50% of that. This is the holy grail. Um, some of our customers, and uh, we have about two minutes left, so I'll go quickly. So we have customers across, so our system is not just for network monitoring. We do business monitoring as well. So we have customers across the board uh, and certainly in the telco space as well. And you can see some of the names here. I wanted to show a few examples of what an anomaly alert looks like and the correlations behind it. So this is an issue on the left here where there was the anomaly that was interesting was that there was a drop in IP core traffic it was correlated with AC power alarms in uh, the data center and also uh, uh, data center temperature that spiked as well. So the core traffic was because of power issues within the data center uh, and that, that let them uh, figure it out uh, much quicker and solve these problems. Uh, this is another example of drop and run, uh, downlink data volumes per province, uh, correlated with spike in error codes in IMS and voltage drop rates. And again, uh, the error codes in IMS helps you understand where, where this uh, drop might be coming from, why it's happening. 
last slide, uh, just to give you a sense of the, uh, you know, from one customer, what what doing the all these steps, even without the remediation, helps with. Um, so this is one one uh, one area of a telco that in, in Europe uh, that we work with. Uh, today, we do, they, we, they send us uh, around ha one and a half billion samples per day. Total metrics count on average per day is around four million. We find when we look at all these individual metrics, because we find anomalies in 100% of them, around 82,000 uh, a single metric anomalies per day, but those get reduced by an order of magnitude to 2,776 on average uh, in the last month at least, uh, correlated anomalies. So it means that a lot of these metrics are correlated to each other. But out of those, using context, we only send 37 alerts per day. So this went down from, you know, 50,000 alerts to about 50 alerts per day, uh, or even less than that. And that's really the, fa the part of the, and of course, uh, good good catch rate or the positive, the false positive rate here is very low. The, most of them are on, tra are on point and an alert means here are all the set of, uh, of KPIs that were anomalous and related to each other, that the system discovered they're related to each other and now deal with these incidents and the mean time to detect and the mean time to solve them was reduced dramatically. And this is a quote from one of our customers. Uh, and with this, I'll uh, end, our, end my presentation. So thank you very much.